It's Jim Paff, and welcome back to the Against Nice podcast, where we believe that nice people are the cruelest of all people because they're subjective and selfish in the way that they address society. Kind people have the interests of others in mind, but they speak truth into society. Follow us on iTunes, give us a five-star rating, and also uh, give us your review of the podcast. You can also follow us on Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many other podcasting apps. Now let's get to the show. Really looking forward to this interview with Gary Varvel. He's a political cartoonist. Now in the age of newspapers, you had a real opportunity to get a bit of humor and sarcasm, but serious uh, editorial uh, content from editorial cartoonists. And Gary Varvel is one of the guys who really mastered that form and as newspapers started going away you're not seeing as many editorial cartoonists but he comes from a christian conservative perspective and this is a really fun interview because he's got a lot of great insights about what's going on now about the art form that really is beginning to wane but played a major role in political discussion in uh, america really nearly from its founding and uh, as far back as Poor Richard's Almanac, before the founding of the United States, this art form was very critical. And Gary Varvel is one of the great ones that ever uh, entered into the fray through political cartoonists. So uh, here we go with our discussion with Gary Varvel. Without further ado, I think you're going to really enjoy this podcast. Well, I'm really excited to have uh, Gary Varvel on the podcast today uh here on the against nice podcast he's one of the nicest guys you ever know but we'll talk by the way gary we'll talk about the the whole against nice thing here and through there but gary is he's a christian he's a conservative national award-winning syndicated cartoonist for creator syndicate uh he's also a speaker and a filmmaker be glad to hear a little bit about that and he's the former editorial cartoonist for the indianapolis star we're both native hoosiers and as I always tell people, I'm from Indianapolis. We run a little race there you might have heard of. <laughs> you can start using that, by the way, Gary, if you'd like. I, I okay. offer you that opportunity. Just I want attribution. <laughs> but uh, anyway, welcome, Gary Varvel, to the Against Nice podcast. I'm glad you came on today. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to talk. So um, you spent 40 years during doing editorial cartoons. Yeah. Or in the newspaper industry, I guess maybe not that right. entirely that. So, right. um, th- there have been so many great editorial cartoonists in this country's yeah. history, and in mm-hmm. fact, I think in some ways, even though the art form is still out there, you're still producing some, even though yeah, on, in a semi-retired way. Michael Ramirez, you, you two are probably the most notable ones uh today uh certainly from the conservative side of the aisle um but there have been some amazing editorial cartoonists it is an art form that i think (laughs) as pastor when our generation moves along really might not quite ever be what it was before what what's your sense of the history of editorial cartooning and where we're at now it has a great and an amazing history. I mean, Ben Franklin is always credited with doing one of the first uh, American editorial cartoons uh, drawing uh, for his poor Richard uh, newspaper. But he uh, he did the you know the snake that was all segmented and 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 with the title "Join or Die." And yeah. uh, so, but you know, you go back to Thomas Nast. Um, he's a great name. He's the guy who. Uh, really gave us what we consider Uncle Sam to look like. He's the guy who drew uh, the donkey and the elephant representing the uh, Republican and, and Democratic Party. So they, it does have a great history and it's in a great tradition. Um, when I think of, like, for instance, Herblock, uh, who drew for the Washington Post for so many years, uh, but there were other just fantastic uh, editorial cartoonists through the time through the time period and and impacted politics because it was the it's this visual commentary that even people who don't want to take time to read you know six seven hundred word editorial or, or a column 
uh, they can look at the cartoon and get the idea pretty quick. You know, I, I had a lady who uh, met me at church once, and it was during that time where you do the meet and greet thing, and we're shaking hands. Back when we used to be able to shake hands. And yeah. she said somebody, she was new to the church, but somebody told her that I was a cartoonist. And she said, is that true? I said, yeah. She goes, well, well what cartoon do you draw? And I said, well, I draw, I draw the editorial cartoon. Where's that in the newspaper? And I said, well, that's on the editorial page. Oh, you're the guy that draws cartoons that are not funny. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> You know, that, but that's not, that's not the main goal of an editorial cartoon. The main goal is to express an opinion. And, and so humor is like a tool that we use, and sometimes it's not the right tool, right? So sometimes the cartoons aren't funny. We're trying to make more of a point. But um, I got attracted to it, uh, I guess, almost by accident. When I look back over my life, I can see how God just moved me from one station to the next and you know, opened doors and closed doors. But uh, – I remember when I was 12 years old, I saw Mad Magazine in a store, mm -hmm. and I was, I was like glued to it, and I picked it up and started looking at it, my dad bought it for me, and, and continued to buy me some through like the er, late 60s, early 70s, and, and I would practice drawing, you know, I, I was um, pretty athletic as a kid, played a lot of sports, and so, but if it was rainy, you know, I, was, I would just get out paper and just look, look at Mad Magazine and draw. And I, I really kind of, you know, when people say, how'd you learn how to draw? Where'd you go to school? Uh, Mad Magazine was kind of my cartooning teacher. Uh, yeah. I learned from those guys. And then, so uh, when I got to high school, I drew a cartoon. I drew cartoons for my school newspaper. And a, a lady from the PR department at the Indianapolis Star came out to give a speech to my journalism class. She saw my cartoons in the school newspaper. I find it interesting. A lot of, news, a lot of schools don't have a newspaper anymore or don't have anything like it, uh, you know, even a, maybe an online thing. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, but she suggested I contact Jerry Barnett, the editorial cartoonist at the Indianapolis News. And when I did, uh, I called him and he asked me to come up and visit him. And, and that, that phone call changed my life uh, because it led to my meeting him and I was starstruck. And uh, when he told me what he did for a living, which is he would come to work at eight o'clock in the morning and he would draw a cartoon and go home at noon. And I thought <laughs> as a 17 year old, where do you sign up for this four hour day? I can't believe it. <laughs> and uh, that kind of set me on course, but he told me this was 1974. And he's told me, he said, uh, I got to warn you. He said, I think you could do this for a living. You're that good. But he said, you, you need, obviously you need to work at it. But he said, uh, there's only 200 of these jobs in the country. Now, that was 1974. Today, I swear, there's probably less than 15 jobs. Uh, uh, when I left, I, you know, I always said there was about 20 jobs left. Uh, when I left the star, and I took the buyout, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> when they pay you to leave, take the money and go. Yeah, uh, really. <laughs> that's what I did. Uh, but at the time I left, there was... I think three or four other cartoonists left at the same time. You know, Gannett was kind of trimming the fat. Yeah. And, um, and so some, some of us left, like Steve Benson, a Pulitzer Prize-winning editorial cartoonist, and, and he was let go. And, and uh, uh, so I, Marshall Ramsey down in Mississippi, there were several of us uh, who all of a sudden just took, took off. And so that there's just those newspapers are not replacing uh, us. And that has been the habit for a long time. So what you have to do is you have to adapt. I've, I've learned that, um, that if you don't change, you die, you've got yeah. to keep changing. And so then that was why one of the first, I was one of the first cartoonists in the country to do color cartoon, uh, editorial cartoons have always been black and white, you know, it was a serious kind of form, and, but I started doing them in color. Uh, I saw Jim Borgman was doing it in color. I started doing it in color and then other guys around the country. And now I, everybody does it in color. If you're going to be on the internet, you've got to be in color. And, yeah. uh, and I love it. I love my work better in color than I did in black and white. So anyway, that, that, that kind of fast forward through my career. I, the other thing too was, um, as you said, I wasn't an edit editorial cartoonist for 40 years. I, uh, I got a job in 1978 working for the Indianapolis News in the art department in the newsroom, and uh, there were three of us, and then I was promoted to be the chief of that department, and then during that time period, I still wanted to do editorial cartoons. That was my dream, 
And I would apply anytime I saw an opening, you know, there were cartoonists who were retiring and some who died. And so there'd be an opening and then I would apply. And during that whole time period, 16 years rejected from every one of those jobs. But I also learned that, you know, there, there were times when it was actually a blessing to be rejected because I, I didn't get the job in San Diego. They had a newspaper there. They had two newspapers yeah. in that town. Yeah. And I didn't get the job. J.D. Crow got the job. And a year later, that newspaper folded. And I talked to J.D. later on, and he said he was out of work for three years. Wow. Now, he's working, at a paper, he's working in the paper down in Alabama, I believe, right now. But um, <clears throat> So I, I, I can see now that because I, was, I didn't get that job, I was still in Indianapolis. So when Charlie Warner, who was the cartoonist at the Indianapolis News, uh, when he retired, I applied for that job, and, and I got it. And so... So in 1994, I, so I, I got the dream to do this in 1974, 1994, I finally got the job. Yeah. So it was a long, it was a long journey for me, but, uh, I got to do it for 24 years and I loved it there. Uh, it wasn't my dream job, but time changed. And I knew from the time I got the job, I knew there was coming a day there was, there would be a last day here. And I didn't, I didn't fear it. Uh, the only apprehension, Jim, I would tell you is that, you know, working 40 years for the same company, that's a rare thing anymore. No, nobody does that. But uh, it, I could see that, you know, I'd always tell people, well, God is my provision, but he provided the star and that had been my provision for so long. And at 62, uh, I didn't know what else I was going to do. No newspapers are hiring editorial cartoonists. I, right. I'm syndicated. My, my work appears in 125 newspapers around the country, but uh, I can't live off of that. I mean, it's not enough. So I need more. But I've been pleasantly surprised at, to see how God has just brought stuff my way. And so I have been, I've done actually better <laughs> yeah, on my own. That's awesome. Uh, that's awesome. There's a great liberty to, to that. There is. Uh, and by the way, so, and you, you, in that career, you made as huge an impact as just about any editorial cartoonist. And again, I don't know that editorial cartoonists, are going to have the same impact in the future. But I'm just curious early on before we get into that. So, and, and, and people around the country listen to this podcast. So not everyone knows yeah. about Jerry Barnett and his career yeah. in, at yeah. the Indianapolis star, because I, he may have been nationally syndicated, but he wasn't one of the top guys. But I re, I remember yeah. so many times as a kid reading the star in the news and mm-hmm. just grinding my teeth at Jerry Barnett because he, he really, he came from a left, more Democrat perspective and uh, often, and, and here you, you were and you hit on the right side, but he was very encouraging to you. In this day, well, well, that, of, I, would, I, would, I would just say that Jerry would consider him, has always considered himself as, as a conservative. He might've been a little more moderate than, uh, yeah. the, than the, the star was. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he and I, we agree on everything. I mean, he's 83 yeah. now. We still Is talk he? every once in a while. Yeah. yeah uh, he, and he, I, I, I love him. He's like a second dad to me. Really. Oh yeah. And, and by the way, because, and, and the funny thing is you've got to clarify that because I think that there, there's a time there were many times doing politics in Indiana. I was like, Oh my gosh, what are you doing? You know, with, with yeah. something that he would put yeah. up there. And, uh, but yeah, I think when, when we were young, I'm, I'm a little bit younger than you are, but we're, we're close to the same uh, age range. I'm 55, Mm -hmm. but we're, there was a time when you would have this rancor maybe in a political discussion, but you, we really all felt like Americans. I mean, we all would come together, even in the political realm. I remember I went to Indiana university in the mid Mm eighties. I'm scared for kids going there now. But I still had to yeah. face off with people on the left, and it was a challenge. But, you know, you felt, you felt like we, were, we all had substantively the same goals. We just come from a different perspective, and we move on from there. Yeah. We've left that a whole lot now. And, uh, yeah. and, and guys, you know, so having someone like that who – it's good to hear you, you all agree on everything. Uh, you know, but just sometimes that rancor that can be there uh, or different perspectives – we can't we can't navigate it in that way anymore in this country. Well, I I think that you know being in the business as long as I have, I've seen this slide and the shift. Um, when I first started at work at the Indianapolis News, and and I knew the people at the Indianapolis Star, uh, everybody was from Indiana. 
you know, they, they went to IU, they graduated from Ball State or they, you know, went to Indiana State and they, uh, and, or they went to IUPUI and then, you know, they got hired on in a small paper, got pulled up to the newspaper. And, and, and the other thing is that we, a lot of times they would hire young people and they'd stay a long time and they learned and they just got promoted throughout, you know, they start on the obit desk. And, you know, when I came to meet them, uh, they were, they were a columnist you know, or they're an editorial writer and they, they just grew as, in the job. And that, that's what happened to me. I mean, I started off as a, a staff artist, became chief artist and got promoted to the editorial cartoonist. And then, and so I, you know, I had goals. Everybody has goals. My goal was to actually first get the job, which was difficult enough. And then my goal was to become syndicated. Uh, and then my goal was to win a national award. And I was able to achieve all those. And I never won the Pulitzer, but I, I, uh, you know, because of my politics, usually the Pulitzer goes to pretty liberal, uh, right. I, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, it's interesting. I also won one time. Now, Jeff McNally, who I just thought was one of the greatest cartoonists of my life. He was time, awesome. Yeah. Uh, won three times. Uh, and he was, he was conservative, but a lot of people didn't know he was conservative because he kind of poked fun at everybody, you know? Right. Uh, and he, he had a really great sense of humor. So it wasn't mean. Uh, and I've always tried to do that myself. And I've had people tell me both. I've heard people tell me that I'm too mean. And I've heard people, uh, people have told me that, you know, that I'm just right, that I can make a strong point without being mean. And I I try Mm -hmm. to do that. And then I've heard this a lot. Do you call your, a Christian and then you did this cartoon oh. <laughs> um, yeah so um, so humor is an interesting thing because it pokes fun I mean yeah. you're criticizing someone and we are living in an age now of political correctness where you're just not allowed to do that anymore it's ridiculous and without yeah. that you know you really you lose humor and I think that uh, what I tell people as I said well you know, as I read the Bible, uh, John the Baptist said some pretty tough things to the Pharisees. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, Jesus did the same thing. Now, John the Baptist's case, he lost his head over it. And Jesus, right. they crucified. Right. So, but he, he spoke strongly to those who were in power. And I think that's the job of uh, editorial cartoonists. And, and good editorial writing, I think. We're, we're, we're kind of doing the same thing. It's just that we're using different tools. I mean, where... Um, a writer is using lots of bullets, meaning words, to get the point across. I'm dropping bombs, yeah. you know. <laughs> and when I hit the mark, it's devastating. And when I miss the mark, I look pretty stupid, you know. Uh, so, and and you know, we all have bad days. I mean, nobody's perfect. You know, I, I don't know everything, and we're trying to comment a lot of times on things that we don't have full knowledge of. And so we do the best we can. And you know, I've had people say, "If you've done cartoons that you." wish that you hadn't done. Yeah. Everybody, I think everybody, if they're honest to say, yeah, but you know, you have a deadline and you got to crank something out and maybe, you know, your worldview shifts a little bit. Maybe you have more knowledge later on. You go, "Mm, I wish I had done that, but it's done, you know, and I, I just move on. And so, you know, in the beginning of Trump, you know, announcing his campaign, I made fun of it. Mm -hmm. I didn't think this was serious. I didn't really know him, you know? And, uh, so I drew him as a clown and all, all kinds of stuff. But uh, so uh, there are a lot of during the campaign, I, I didn't like that he was so rude. But my idea started to shift when he picked Mike Pence. I thought Mike Pence must be seeing something else that I'm not seeing here. And then I also thought um, if Mike Pence can have that kind of influence, if he can uh, – uh, you know, be a Christian voice to the king, so to speak, like a Daniel right. or a Joseph. Well, then I think that's that's going to be really pretty good. That's, that gives me more comfort. I had a guy who worked, who was a professor at Bob Jones call me, and we talked on the phone. He said, tell me about Mike Pence. And I said, well, we're, we're actually friends. You know, I met him in 1994, and before he ever went into, uh, when he, before he ran for Congress, I mean, we used to meet for lunch and stuff, and I've been to his home. And uh, I said, he's the real deal. Uh, he's a guy who walks the walk and talks the talk. And, and he said, okay. He said, it makes me feel better. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I 
I think I think evangelicals kind of came around to him because of Pence. Uh, I think he. I think if, if Trump didn't have Pence, I don't know that he would have gotten elected. I think the evangelical vote helped him quite a bit. Yeah, being the guy who's worked in the deep trenches at every level of politics in this country, I, even most prognosticators don't know how true your statement is that Mike made a big difference because he did yeah. give evangelicals uh, – some comfort, but, but Trump's also followed through on it. Whatever you think of his personality, he's yeah. also followed through on it and in a sincere manner. In other words, early on, yeah. people were very happy that he would make firm statements. He would talk about right. Right. Uh, protecting the unborn, that he was about li religious liberties, right. but they were still very early on still like, okay, let me, let me just see how this plays out. It sounds great. Now I think any evangelical who pays attention to it. I mean, they might be upset with him on other things, but when they hear him talk about mm -hmm. these key issues, they know he's dead serious about it. So the other thing about Trump is before I left, about a year before I left the star, uh, the newspaper, I, um, I started uh, writing a column for the Indianapolis star. And, and a couple of times I wrote columns about Trump doing what he said, his accomplishments. You know, he had policy uh, he, he had policy decisions that I liked, uh, cutting regulation, cutting taxes, uh, signing new trade deals and doing things for the working man that enabled. And the other thing, too, is understanding being a businessman. He understood that if businesses do well, then their employees do well. Also, they hire more employees because they want to everybody wants to expand their business. But if you're just sucking money out of what the left calls the rich people. Yeah. Well, that's going to actually come out of the pockets of the working man, or they're going to lose their jobs. Uh, just the same thing with uh, uh, a minimum wage, a, a federal mandated minimum wage. Well, okay, you're going to force companies, a small company, to force them to pay $15 an hour. All right, they'll do it, but they're going to have to cut other people's jobs, the guys who are making too much so that they have enough money so they can pay these people. Or they're going to have to raise their prices, which is going to penalize their customers. It's going to come from somewhere. It just doesn't magic. It's not magic money that just happens. Uh, I, Trump understands this kind of stuff. And people who have been a politician from the time they were in the cradle, and that's all the only job they ever have, they don't seem to understand how business works. And uh, so at, being a conservative, I've been able to speak to those kinds of issues for a long time. Um, Sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, and what are we all, what are we doing anyway? We're all trying to be in the, uh, uh, the marketplace of ideas and be in the arena and in trying to influence people, right? And there have been times when I thought that I've had some impact and there have been also times that I just thought, well, I'm not, what is this all about? I'm not doing any good at all. Well, I have and, to say as a, as a um, consumer of your product yeah. for many years, um, First of all, it was it was really cool to see you get syndicated because I had been reading your yeah. stuff in the Indianapolis Star and I knew how fantastic it was. Thank you. But there was a time from the conservative side of things yeah. that you and Michael Ramirez were literally setting the tone to the degree that editorial cartoonists could do it. You two yeah. hit it every single time. It's kind of interesting, by the way. Oh, I, do, I do my uh, podcast out of – a, a store that my wife and I own here in Woodland Park, Colorado. And mm -hmm. there was a couple with their kids that came into the store and he actually was Michael Ramirez's cousin. It was kind of interesting. Oh, really? okay. yeah, yeah. So got a little insight there, but, but I mean, there was a time and I think there are younger people that don't understand the power of editorial cartooning in its real form. Mm -hmm which kind of went away in the early 2000s in a sense. It started to – not. it is there. It still is influential to a certain degree. But, I mean, there was a time that you picked up the paper. You went – if you were an editorial page reader, which not everyone was, <laughs> you went straight to the editorial page. You took a quick yeah. look at that cartoon. And you would do that first because it was a quicker con consumption. And that yeah. could set the tone for mm -hmm. uh, the, the political debate for that whole day. Oliphant from the left, he had the same – kind of influence yeah. and yeah. and if you were on the left you cheered it and if you're on the right you gritted your teeth but it set it in 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 one significant way it set the tone for the day it's 
you know, because uh, editorial cartoon, and by the way, Michael Ramirez and I are, are really good friends. I've been to his home in California. Mm -hmm. uh, he just recently, um, that, the first time I ever heard of Michael Ramirez was I applied for a job at the Memphis uh, Commercial Appeal. Yeah, and, that's right. And, uh, as a former and, FedEx employee, I know I, it's yeah. the Memphis commercial pill. You got it right. <laughs> and uh, I didn't get the job. Michael Ramirez got that job. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's right. I and, forgot he was uh, there. While, and while he was there, and so then while he was there, he had a cartoonist convention and in Memphis. And my wife and I went, and when I got there, he knew who I was. And I I was like, what? How, how would you know me? You know, I was I felt like I was nobody just in Indianapolis. I was doing the job, but. Anyway, he was so nice, and uh, and then later on, uh, uh, after I became syndicated, uh, I took a trip to visit my syndicate in California, a creator syndicate in Los Angeles, and I called him, and I said, hey, I'm going to be out in your neck of the woods, so uh, he said, come, come and spend the day with me, so I went out there, and we spent some time together, and uh, I mean, he's just a great guy. Yeah. Um, and we agree on it in so many things as well. Oh yeah. And he just no. So he he left, and the Memphis Commercial Appeal was hired by the Los Angeles Times, and he was there for uh, several years. And then they changed uh, the paper sold to somebody else. They came in. They wanted him to be more moderate. And he said no, so he quit. And then the <laughs> Investors Business Daily bought him. And right after he went to the Investors Business Daily, he won the Pulitzer again, and the Los Angeles Times missed out. And so then the same thing happened at the uh, Investors Business Daily. So he left there and he was on his own for a while. Now, Michael is just now, and I don't know why I'm talking about him so much. It's not about him. But now he's at the Las Vegas uh, Review Journal. And yeah. so he's uh, doing great work there. Yeah. So uh, anytime my name gets mentioned in the same sentence with Michael Ramirez, I feel like, wow, I've arrived because I think he's, he's just fantastic. Well, maybe, uh, maybe I'm biased in a way, but I'm just going to tell you from, from my perspective, and, you know, as being in the political trenches for over 30 years, like I've been, mm -hmm. you know, you pay attention to the news and there is no doubt that the two of you from the conservative perspective really set the debate in so many ways, or you encapsulated uh, what was going on in a yeah. way that people hadn't thought about yet. That, that played right. a significant role in our political communication in this country. And you were a, a sincerely an important part of that for many years. So, uh, you know, I went to a cartoonist convention in Columbus and uh, I can't remember when this was probably early, you know, it must have been about 2011 maybe. And uh, I was standing there talking with a group. There were about six of us. Now there's not very many editorial cartoonists left. Right. right. And one of the guys said, and I was, we all agreed, we were so fortunate to be born when we were because they said, you, we are all dinosaurs. We are looking at the last possible last yeah. generation of editorial cartoonists yeah. because look, the problem happened was, and you know, probably your listeners are wondering why. And what happened was when the internet came onto the scene uh, and everybody flushed to the internet and so did newspapers, but we couldn't figure out how do we make money here? Uh, you know, it's possible to have a larger audience online, but when I started working at the Indianapolis Star, uh, we had four, we would publish on Sunday, 450,000 copies of the Indianapolis Star. And so if you have a traditional family of four, I mean, your stuff is getting seen by lots of people just in oh, your yeah. local town. Yeah. And, and, and then couple that with syndication, my, my stuff gets seen by millions and I don't even think about it. But as time went on, uh, people had other places to put their advertising dollars. We used to have at the start, and every newspaper would have had this, a national uh, ad salesman who just sat by the phone and they called him and said, we want to spend $10,000 this week. I mean, he would just do that all day, all week long. That went away. Yeah. Box stores started closing. You know, some of these big stores started closing and, and or consolidating or buying being bought out. You know, there's no Sears anymore, for instance. Right. And that started hurting newspapers. So we started trying to find other ways to uh, to uh, supplement the income. So we started doing a paywall. So a lot of websites do that. People don't like it because they like getting their stuff for free. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it just became very difficult. And so as the, as the profits started to drop, 
newspapers had to start cutting. And one of the first places they would cut is an editorial cartoonist because they could get a syndicated cartoon for peanuts and they wouldn't have right. to pay full salary and benefits. Yeah. And I was, that's why, you know, I was fortunate to be able to do it so long and be kept there. You know, the benefit of a local cartoonist is that they can write and draw about local issues. You know, the syndicated guy is not going to be drawn about your governor or legislator right. or something like that. Right. But I know of editorial cartoonists who only did local cartoons and they Jer lost. Jerry Barnett was one of those. He almost never did a national issue. Yeah. He I did recall. a lot of local stuff. Yeah, yeah. He did a lot of local stuff. And, yeah. uh, so, and Jerry, I, he, re, he retired in 99. And uh, so he's 20 years older than me. And so we both, you know, did this job for a long time. And then we both left about the same age and have continued on to do other stuff. But anyway, you know, it's, it's just a fact of life. I never was bitter about that at all. I get it. I understand it. And then I also have a biblical worldview. So my thinking is that whatever happens to me, God allowed that to happen to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There were times I got my myself into trouble, and and I recognized that uh, the Lord has allowed this into my life to either grow me, to teach me something, and and uh, so I, you know, I loved my time and doing all of that, but I love being on my own. I mean, yeah. So I think going forward, editorial cartoonists are going to have. I mean, if you're a young editorial cartoonist, you can't rely on a newspaper to be your gravy train i mean that's not going to be how you get subsidized to be able to do, make a living you're going to have to find a way to attract an audience and then you're going to have to figure out a way to monetize it you know uh so i i do if you go to garyvarvel.com today you can sign up for my free newsletter and uh and so you get my newsletter you'll get at least one cartoon every week one sometimes two you'll also get links to the stuff that i've been reading that has been feeding me and I'll also write a short little commentary myself about, you know, what I thought about the week. And, uh, and I try to write from a biblical worldview. So there I'll include Bible verses and that kind of thing, right. uh, which is you're not going to get that from other, you know, other, uh, any other cartoonists really, I think. And then I also have a pay version of my newsletter, $25 a year. I mean, that's nothing, but for $25 a year, you'll get every cartoon I draw, Plus archive cartoons that people haven't seen for years. You know, if I think it's a, the appropriate time to run that. And I'll also show you videos of how I draw my cartoon. So it's just an added bonus. I mean, if you want to be entertained, I think my, my uh, newsletter, which is Varvel's Views from the Right, uh, I think it is probably the best newsletter because you get everything. And a lot of newsletters out there will give you a lot of the news stuff but they're not going to give you all the visual stuff. So it's a lot of eye candy, you know? Right. And, uh, so which is, I, which I is really critical to monetize that stuff in this day and age. It really is. Right. Important. Right. You, know, you have to, I mean, uh, well, you know, when you think about it, that's what the newspaper's doing. They're yeah. using your stuff to monetize. So mm -hmm. they know that the people who like you, uh, are going to come to the, that newspaper or the newspaper website to see you. And then they can sell advertising and, uh, or maybe that you'll buy a subscription to the newspaper based on you being there. Well, I got to do that for myself now. So yeah. everybody's got to kind of build their own uh, platform. And so I'm, I'm still in the process of growing it, but I've had pretty good success after a year. So I'm coming up on a, on one year of the newsletter and, but I want to continue to grow it. And then uh, the other thing is I, I came out with a book uh, last year, uh, late last year. So it's still relatively new called drawing the right way. And it's not how to draw. It's a cartoon of drawing the conservative way, really. And it's, it's a car, I call it drawing the right way, a cartoonist, a conservative cartoonist view of the world. And so that's available on my website at GaryVarvel.com. It's the only place you can buy it. You can't get it on Amazon and you can't get it in the bookstores and that kind of stuff. So you have to come to my website to get that. And I do some public speaking. I also do some commission work. Um, Next week, I'm flying to uh, Orlando. I'm going to be speaking at the uh, uh, State Financial Officers Foundation, uh, which is state treasurers from all across the country are going to be there. And uh, so I'm going to be entertaining them. And uh, so I, I like doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. The public speaking thing is fun. Yeah. Well, I'm, it, 
you, I know then since you're trying to communicate all of your stuff in this way, I was, I, I just getting prepared for this. I was listening to an interview you said, and it really sparked something. You, you've worked in the news uh, drawing sphere. I've worked in the straight up political running campaigns, yeah. doing legislative efforts career. Um, but, but we're, I think both trying to do the same thing, kind of communicate yeah. from the, the fundamental principles of life, the deep values yeah. that matter. So I've in my eight, nearly eight years on Capitol Hill running uh, congressional campaigns, I had a lot of young people that would work for me, some Christians, mm-hmm. some not. And I always tell them, I'd say, uh, you know, you need to read a proverb a day, whether you're a Christian right. or not, you need to do it. Smart. One of the things yeah. that helped me tremendously in politics and, and, and that I felt the Lord impressed upon me very early on was you better be wise. <laughs> well, what better way yeah. than Proverbs? So I, right. I, I, and I don't, I don't read a proverb every single day in my life since then, but I'll go through long periods where I'm doing this because I want to revisit where am I at here? Yeah in all this, the wisdom to deal with the problems in politics, which Reagan right. said that politics is the world's second oldest prof- profession and very much like the first. Yeah. Um, uh, that wisdom is invaluable. In fact, our mutual friend, uh, Bill Smith, who ran Indi- Indiana Family Institute uh-huh. and, um, and, the, and was uh, Mike Pence's chief of staff on Capitol Hill there. I know they're still uh-huh. close and good friends. Um, uh, Bill even told me, he says, listen, if you want to do politics the right way, you're going to have to work harder. If you want to do it the moral and uh, principled way, you just got to work a whole lot harder. So anyway, I always would tell a young kid, you got to read a proverb a day, whether you, yeah. whether you're a Christian or not, you need to do it. Right. There's wisdom there. You need, you, you talked about how in one interview I saw that you were uh, mentioning how you read a chapter of the, the Bible a day and you felt that that gave, gave you some insight in oh, yeah. how to get the right message out. Um, do, do you agree with me? Like this is maybe the most important principle, not just to, con- to communicate conservative ideas, but to communicate these archetypal ideals and, and get them into a common place where people can grab onto it and gain something from it. The, the world needs people who will speak the truth to the, the society. And what we are seeing in America today, and it, Jim, you and I, I'm 63, you and I know that this is not the same country that we grew up in. Yeah. And why is that? Well, I can look at a lot of reasons. One, in 1962, we kicked the Bible reading and prayer out of the school. Mm-hmm. Ten years later, ten years later, eleven years later, uh, we we uh, we had the Roe v. Wade case decided by uh, the Supreme Court, and so then we had abortion in this country. Sixty-two million babies have been aborted since 1973. I believe that there's a God. I don't believe I ha- I don't have enough faith to believe that there was nothing, and then all of a sudden there was a big bang, and then you had all of this order take place, and and then all of this life began on this planet, nowhere else that we can find, and that an apple tree decides it's only going to produce apples and not oranges, and the same thing with an orange tree, it's just going to produce oranges. There's order, and I don't know how people can't understand it. Now, I believe in one miracle. God has always existed. I can't explain it, but that has to be true. And then everything else is explained, but I don't have enough faith to be an evolutionist and an atheist because... They have to believe that there was nothing. And then all of a sudden there was everything and that it all figured itself out over millions of years. I, you'd have to have trillions and trillions of miracles that have to take place. And I don't have that, no, that much faith. Now, they might say it's science, but they weren't there. They didn't see it. They can't replicate it. It's not science. They're, it's their imagination. It's, it's, uh, it's a rebellion against the word of God. And when you read the word of God, Well, there's guys like Lee Strobel, who was a journalist, who was an atheist, and his wife became a Christian, and he wanted to prove her wrong, and so he did an investigation of the the Bible using journalistic principles and became a believer. And the case for Christ, which became a movie, and he's continued to write books about. And so 
what we are seeing is a nation that has turned its back on God and God has said, okay, you don't want me involved. You're on your own. And things are spiraling out of control. People are doing what is right in their own eyes. That's what the book of Judges said. Mm -hmm. And see, everything ties to what the word of God says. I recognized when I was young that God had given me a specific skill set. I, I was artistic. I was right-brained. I, I could see. So when I came to realize that Ephesians 2.10 says that we are all God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do, I thought, okay, now i got to find out what God wants me to do with this gift. If he gave me a gift, he wants to use it, he's going to give me something to do with it. And then when I look back through my life, I see, okay, I randomly, you know, you, some people can say random. I think it was divinely appointed. I, <laughs> I meet this PR lady at the star. She connects me to Jerry Barnett. He encourages me. And then he, uh, he's the guy who called me and said, we have an opening at the Indianapolis News four years later. And so everything I can see, uh, my syndication, for instance, this is incredible. Uh, I had been, I'd send my stuff to syndicates all the big ones, Los Angeles Times, King Features, Creators, and I re was rejected year after year. And I'd send them stuff, they reject me. I'm doing, I'm an editorial cartoonist, but I'm getting rejected. And so then one day I get to work and I have a phone call, a voicemail message from uh, John Newcomb. And he says, this is John Newcomb, a creator syndicate, and we're interested in picking up your work. Could you give me a call back? I thought this was a joke because the previous week, I had gotten a rejection letter from Creator Syndicate. <laughs> so I called him and he said, no, this is real. We're really, we want your stuff. Well, John made a trip to Indianapolis and we had breakfast together. And I said, I'm confused because you guys rejected me. And then the next week you call me. And he said, was that letter signed by Anita Tobin? And I said, yeah. And he said, yeah, she doesn't work for us anymore. Oh. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and uh, I guess she had been, you know, just rejecting people on her own. But he asked me in the interview, he asked me, he, he says, are you a Christian? I said, yeah. I said, why do you ask? And he said, because I saw your work in, in World Magazine. I sold myself to World Magazine. You know, I had contacted them and said, you know, would you buy my stuff? And I sent them stuff and then they started using it. And John was a Christian, and he saw my stuff in World Magazine, and he said, I went to my brother, who's the president of Creators, and I said, if we don't pick this guy up, somebody else is going to, and we're going to lose him. And he said, I think he's going to be good. Wow. And so based on that, so God put you know, a Christian, uh, yep. the brother of the, the president, who, and that's how I got a Creators syndication job. Hmm. Um, so anyway, I... I think that, uh, so I kind of see my job as I, I've got to uh, speak biblical truth to a society uh, that needs it, that has forgotten God. I'm trying to wake them back up. Now, at the time, I'm working for a secular newspaper, so my job is not to be, you know. Right. But if you have Christmas, Christmas is a Christian. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, same thing with Easter. And so when you have those kinds of holidays, I can draw about that. When somebody dies who I know is a Christian, I can actually show them meeting Jesus, you know, that kind of thing. Ravi Zacharias died not too long ago. So I drew right. him running into the arms of Jesus, you know, right, in right. heaven. Um, so I think that and I, the other things like pro-life issues, that, those kinds of things I can use. I have yeah. to be wise about it, but I can use my biblical worldview to address those kinds of things. And so, um, you know, I read Proverbs every day and I, and that's the way my wife and I raised our children too. We would go through and we would just speak biblical truth to them and they were all walking with the Lord today. And it, so it, that, that does work. I, um, so when I look at society and what's happening today, uh, I see, uh, a, a people who have forgotten God. So it, the best I can, I try to point them back to there is a God. And, uh, and I try to use, so when I was writing a column the year before I, the year before I left, I would try to start every column with a Bible verse. <laughs> and that always kind of, what? And because I just think that, Hey, what God has to say about issues is more important than what I have to say about it. Right, and right. Then, then I would just go on and just kind of roll off of what that Bible verse was saying. Yeah, I, you know, I, 
If you read Isaiah 59, it is a wake-up call because it starts off by saying, is the arm of the Lord too short that he can't save or is ear dull that he can't hear? But your sins have caused a separation between you and your God so that he will not hear you. Mm -hmm. And that's sobering that there could be, there could go, there could come a time where people would pray to God and he just wouldn't listen to them anymore. That's what happened to Israel. And when in case of Israel, then he brought uh, Babylon, which came and destroyed Jerusalem and it took people captive and they were in, you know, in captivity for 70 years before God and God had already said he was going to bring them back to the land. But I'm thinking now that that's not addressing specifically America, but when I look at verse 14, it says that the problem with Israel at that time was that righteousness couldn't get through. Justice had been perverted because truth had fallen in the street and couldn't get up. And I thought, wait a minute, that's what's happening to America. Yeah. There's no absolute truth anymore. Yeah. I mean, for heaven's sakes, when, we, when you have a child who's born who has the genitalia of a male, but we can't say that they're a boy. Right. Because we have to wait until they make a decision on what 56 different genders they want to be. This is insanity. It's no longer truth. Now, notice that that verse doesn't say that truth is dead. Truth can't die. But it's been knocked down in America. And so we need people to stand up and speak the truth. Yeah. I, listen, I, there are uh, two verses. I want to, uh, there's a certain order I want to go. So there are two verses, I think, as well that really speak to this. Where am I? Sorry. I got to find this here. You just got me thinking about it. And, and, yeah. uh, but, uh, come on. I just shared it the other day. Well, while you're looking for that, oh, I also look at, uh, second Timothy chapter three, it starts off and it says that in the last days, people, men will be like, and then it gives you a whole long list and yeah. it, sounds like you're reading the newspaper of what's going on today. People yeah. will be unloving, unforgiving. The cancel culture is unforgiving. If you do something that offends them, they want you fired. They don't want you to ever make a living again. And you can apologize from today until the cows come home and they will not forgive you. That is what people are like today. Yeah. And, and so when you read it, you go, wow. We're, we're there. Yeah. Here's another, uh, Hosea um, 4, 2 through 4. Uh, there is swearing or lamenting, actually. That doesn't yeah. mean like using yeah. foul language. There is swearing, deception, murder, stealing, and adultery. They employ violence so that bloodshed follows bloodshed. <laughs> Therefore, the land mourns and everyone who lives in it languishes along with the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky and also the fish of the sea dis disappear. Yet let no one find fault and let none offer reproof for your people are like those who contend with the priest. So you will stumble by day and the prophet will also stumble with you by night and I will destroy your mother. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected yeah. knowledge. I right. also will reject you from being my priest since you have forgotten the law of your God. I will also forget your children. That, so, I mean, that, it, there's so much in here that, is, that speaks directly what's going on. But there, there's another scripture I want to share that, that really gets into where I'm coming from when I talk about an against nice way of thinking. Because see, niceness is subjective. The, actually, yeah. the definition of nice is something that's pleasing or acceptable. That's the, yeah. that's the actual definition, which is that's subjective. What's pleasing uh -huh. and acceptable is by my perspective, not by a general perspective. Whereas kindness is, seeks the good of others. And that usually shows up in a way that we typically call nice. But there are times, like with the Pharisees, you talked about that early in the podcast, and others where you call out the evil, like Hosea did, mm -hmm. in, 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 and also in the verses that you shared. And, and um, so a kind person is ready to be courageous and stand for truth even when opposed. And I describe it this way, uh, no parent 
who doesn't discipline their children is considered very kind and no child right. that's being disciplined thinks it's very nice. Right. You know, they're, 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 and, and everyone say, why are you using this patriarchal or whatever? You know, well, no, well, that's, that's, that's just one example. example. Exactly. That's a good example. So, you know, our founding fathers understood this. John Adams, the second president of the United States, he said this, he said, we have given, we don't have a government that is capable of, of, uh, I'm trying to think, I'm messing up the quote, but it, he's basically saying that it's only suitable for a moral and religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Why does he say that? Because you need people who can control themselves. And we don't have people who control themselves. They're controlled by other people. Uh, this, this Marxist philosophy, this cultural Marxism, uh, this uh, critical race theory, all it does is make people angry and they hate other people like who are different from them. That is not biblical. And so the, John, uh, George Washington in his farewell address, he said that uh, religion and morality are indispensable supports. And in vain would that man claim the, pa the tribute of patriotism who try to subvert these great pillars of human happiness. And he said, and uh, it's, and I'm messing up the quote here, but he, what he said was, uh, uh, and you can't have morality without religion. He said, reason and experience tell us that you can't have one without the other. And yeah. why is that? I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm not religious, but, you know, I have, I'm a moral person. Well, yeah, you can be. What's it, what's it based on? Why? Yeah. yeah. I think any religion is going to teach you some basic principles, and in some religion is better than nothing, but I think that, that uh, biblical instruction teaches us to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Yeah. That's the two greatest commandments, right? But we have people who don't love other people. I used this example once. I, uh, you know, it's annoying when you're driving in traffic and people cut you off, right? Mm -hmm. am, I, am I the only one that gets annoyed by that? I think everybody does. <laughs> okay, all right. So, so get this. Uh, one day I was teaching uh, at school. So there, for 14 years I taught art at, at a Bethesda Christian school, all right? So I would teach a couple hours and I would go to work at the Indianapolis Star. So I'm on my way to the school and they were doing some construction. And so we had two lanes narrowed down to one. And so I'm in the left lane, I'm in the narrow lane, and I look at my rearview mirror and I see a car coming up. It's a red car. And I put on the brakes and I let the red car just slide right in front of me. And I was happy to do it. You know why? Because it was my son. My son, <laughs> whom I love, was a little late and I saw him coming up and I, so I let him slide in right in front of me. Now, if we love other people, what it said to me was, Gary, you don't always love everybody else. And so yeah. if I love other people, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt in that kind of situation. Right. And uh, just like, you know, I, I love my son. But we, that is where we are as a society. And the founding fathers re realized that, you know, we have a government set up here. But if the people are immoral, the government's not able to do much else. I mean, you can keep hiring police officers. Right. But at some point, you, you got – it really – in order for this capitalistic society to work, you have to have people who don't lie, cheat, and steal. Uh, for the most part, you got to be able to trust right. one another in order for us to, to work. Well, so, and, you and know, I, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, so, you know, my job, I see it, you know, when I get up every day is to try to point out where I see people are going off the rails and to kind of expose it, poke fun at it. I drew a cartoon today. Um, Pelosi said that we have arrows in our quiver that we can use against the president. <laughs> oh man! So, so okay. I, I show you what those arrows are. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I'm looking forward to that one. I could see yeah. a lot of a lot of fun with that. But sure. So um, you know, and and I I, I got to tell you, uh, the other concern I have, you are exactly right, and and uh, John Adams was extremely wise in what he said. Yeah. I think. Washington was even wiser. You know, there's yeah. so much in that farewell address, which is what you oh, heard yeah. from. That is amazing about war, about party politics, so many things it, that, it, that he just be, was prophetic be, about. This should be taught in the schools today. Yeah. yeah. But it's not. We're, tr we're, we're teaching, you know, uh, uh, Jordan. Critical Peterson race theory. <laughs> critical race theory. See, 
Uh, yeah. And that's something that, that just somebody just thought up and, and it is effective in, in indoctrinating kids to either be a, ashamed of being whatever color they are or angry and seeing themselves as a victim and that all my problems are, are somebody else's fault. We've got to own it. That's right. You know, life is hard. Life's not fair. And you just got to have to go with it. Yeah, and I'm going to tell you, I, I think one of the big problems we've got right now is that so much of these problems uh, have these fundamental uh, anchors and wisdom, you know, that we've just been talking about. Mm -hmm. But even more importantly, you've got people who are in, of religious faith, Christians, even Jews and others of religious faith, as well, who are not asserting truth in society. So I, no. I started thinking about this against nice thing. Uh, I think back in 2009, I had Andrew Breitbart in to yeah. do a, I was running Americans for prosperity in Colorado at the time we were doing a big event uh, at the Capitol. So we're talking afterwards and he's mentioning how um, he loves Christians because we wouldn't have freedom without the Judeo Christian ethic going right back to what you're talking about earlier. You know, where does your morality come from? I mean, even, even the, I, I really believe that John Adams in that statement, he was, he had Thomas Paine in mind as much as he had George Washington and others, because, you know, even Thomas Paine, even though he was an, an atheist saw the Bible as a good place for some moral teaching and stuff like that. So, yeah. so where does it come from? It really does come from that. It ultimately comes from God. But I, I have to tell you, I've been saying this regularly. I believe we have homosexual marriage in this country because of Christians. I don't think we have it because of homosexual activists because mm. we, we're, we, we suck at marriage. We're bad at it. We, yeah. you know, we're, we're, our numbers are just as bad as anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, Justin Martyr uh, in the second century was making in, in his book, The Apology, where he was uh, standing up for Christians to Antonius Pius, the then emperor. He was able to argue from the morality of Christians that, that existed in Rome at the time and show why they they were superior. I don't I don't know that he could make that same argument today. So that's the other thing. So so um uh Andrew told me, he says, listen, I want to stand up for Christians. I feel like I'm the guy that's got to fight for them because they're too nice. That's kind of what yeah. kind of got me uh, going and thinking yeah. through this. Yeah. And he's right. Um, yeah. I, I think we're also trying to subscribe so much to certain aspects of the culture that we're, we're Christians who believe in truth don't distinguish themselves. And to be mm -hmm. candid, all the great works of uh, philosophy and thought for centuries – is founded on these fundamental truths. And again, whether the person who wrote it claimed Christ or not, mm -hmm. uh, they, they were drawing from these rational, fundamental principles that have their origin in God. And until that's reasserted in society, until there's repentance, by the way, in the church yeah. for allowing it to go that way, I, yeah. don't, I don't know how we get back. Well, our problem, too, you know, talking about the church, we have wimpy Christians. Uh, we don't want anybody to not like us. Yeah. And uh, I had a pastor who used to say, if you've never met the devil, it's because you're going the same direction. Yeah. Uh, you, you need to go against the, the culture, you know, and, and there, when you do, you're going to be faced with opposition, people who don't like it. But what did Jesus say? They hated me. They hate you because they hated me first. And we have to recognize that, uh, you know, who are you going to identify with? Are you going to be a friend of the world? Or are you going to be a friend with Christ? And if you're going to follow Christ, then you can't be, you know, you're going to have to rebel against the world in a world direction. So, yeah, we have stood back and just let things go. And it's because we don't want to make anybody upset. Or we think that, well, we can't win them if we don't befriend them. I, I think back to... Uh, uh, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3 at, at the day of Pentecost. And the big crowd is there. And Peter starts speaking. And this is what he says to him. Uh, God sent the Messiah, and he was Jesus, and you killed him. I mean, that's not, that's not uh, a seeker-sensitive message. Yeah, really. He's, he's basically <laughs> telling them he's dead because of you guys. You killed him. It's your fault. And they, they were like, they were cut to the heart. 
But isn't it, that interesting? Know, because if you would hold back on that, you think, oh my gosh, I'm going, I'm going to offend these people. What was the reaction? No, the reaction was they received the message, not a, a, every entire one of them, but in general. Well, it said 3,000 were added to the church that day. Yeah, so yeah. there's 3,000 of them who went, okay, I, I'm guilty here. It's my, yeah. And I think that we don't, we all see ourselves as good people. I, I met uh, Ray Comfort many, many years ago. Ray Comfort has the ministry, and and, uh, and he's an interesting guy. But uh, the way of the master, and his ministry called the way of the master is because the way Jesus talked to people about eternal things. And he would use the law, you know. Have you uh, lied? Have you stolen? Have you... You know, use the Lord's name in vain, takes that very seriously. And if you've broken any of those, and it only takes one, then you're lost. God's not going to let non-perfection into his perfect heaven. And so we have a sin problem. It's killing us. Uh, we will die and go into eternity without God, without, uh, you know, having it, without the grace of God. We experience the grace of God every day. The sun's shining where I'm at. And we have rain and, and things grow and we have food and that's all the grace of God. Can you imagine in an eternity without any of that, without the grace of God? Well, um, I believe that if people don't see that they have a need, they will never respond to the truth. They all think that they're good people. And so that's the point of the law. The law is to show us that we've fallen short and we have a need and we have a need for a savior. And that's why. Jesus came to die for our sins because the wages of sin is death. He died for that. He also rose back to life because he's God and he offers eternal life to anyone who puts their trust in him. It's almost like somebody paying my debt and I've accepted their payment for my debt and found now, now I'm set free. Uh, so that's, he came to, to find a people who would love him, but love is only love if it's free. If it, he, that's why he doesn't force us to believe. Yeah. And, and by I, the now, way, 6,000 oh, go go 6, years of human recorded human history proves the moral depravity of man. So yeah, it's in that context that we think we're pretty good or whatever. And let's just be honest. It's, it's just pretty bad. And, and the question is um, how well will we uh, move that forward? But in the short time we have left, I, I want to throw this out too. Um, you know, that, that example in, of Peter in front of the, the, the folks in the temple in Acts mm -hmm. chapter 2. I mean, note that he had a very long apologetic before that. And I, I don't think yeah. that people of goodwill and, and people who call themselves Christians, I don't think they have an apologetic because they don't spend the time studying and thinking. They won't use logic. They think you got to be dumb. They think that's all Greek stuff. It's not all Greek stuff. Aristotle wrote down his principles of logic, but all he was doing was codifying what was already there from eternity. We don't think through what we're doing and what's going on and learn how to address it. And that, that is a huge problem for the future if it's not something that fundamentally changed. By the way, there's, there's things even more fundamental than that that need to change. We really need a spiritual touch from God to change this country because I don't think no, we have another hope. We, we need a revival, obviously, uh, but we need the pulpits are not bold as, you know, I, I think about some of the preachers in the past that I grew up with and, and it was pretty, you know, sometimes you left church feeling like you got spanked. But what it did for me was it would make me want to get deeper into the scriptures. And that's why I try to read the Bible every day. Uh, and it's amazing. You'll read the same thing you've read maybe 10 times and see something new that you didn't notice before. I mean, that's just yeah. the way the Bible is very deep. Uh, and, and at times it can be very simple, just simple instruction. Like through the Proverbs, it's just a lot of it's so much common sense. Yeah. Uh, that we just lack. We the, common sense is dead in America today. It is. We have people that do do the dumbest things, and you know, uh, one of the things I got from the Proverbs when I was a young parent was that if you do your job when they're little, then you are actually going to save yourself a lot of grief later on. Because if you Absolutely. raise a fool, if you raise a fool and you never correct them. Uh, you are going to constantly be bailing them out when they're an adult. That's right. 
Uh, you want to do your job to raise them for God. God gave them to you, and you want to raise them for him. And because you really kind of rent children, you'll have them 18, 20 years maybe, and then they're yeah. off on their own. They're not under oh, yeah. your feet anymore. Uh, at least, Lord willing, they're not. I mean, you want to do your job well enough so that they can be self-sustaining. You know, there are three stages of eating. Uh, when a baby is born, you have to feed them because they can't feed themselves. Then eventually they grow up enough where they can feed themselves. And then, Lord willing, they will be able to be, at some point, able to feed someone else. And the same thing in the spiritual realm. When we, when we first become a believer, uh, we need somebody to teach us because we don't know anything other yeah. than we're a sinner and we repented of our sin and we ask God to save us. Uh, so we have to learn. But at some point, you have to start teaching yourself. You have to start feeding yourself. So you have to start reading the Bible. And at, hopefully, you'll learn enough that at some point you can teach others. And certainly as a parent, and I would say I'm speaking directly to men specifically here because I am a man, uh, you have to be the spiritual leader in your home. It, the children need to hear their father tell them biblical truth, and they need to hear, they need to see them pray. Uh, I think that so much of it is caught and not taught. I mean, you do need to teach. And so uh, getting back, Jim, to the problem in America today, we have so many fatherless homes. We have so many children who are growing up, and they don't respect authority because they don't have an authority figure in their home. Yeah. And that's why you see so much resisting of arrest and that kind of thing because people are out of control. And then when things go wrong, they never take the blame themselves. They blame the police because you know, this all goes back to a failure in the home, a failure of parenting. And if we just got in the word of God, we'd know how to do it right. No, we no, are no. a long way from that. We, we need a, a, I think we need a miracle from God to, to turn us the right direction. So what we're supposed to do, you know, I don't, I don't believe in a, uh, a, a, in a uh, trickle down morality where the, the president dictates to everybody, okay, this is what everything is. We need uh, what Cal Thomas called a bubble up morality. We need, you know, neighbor impacting neighbor, uh, older people uh, impacting younger people and showing them that there is a God and he did make America the greatest world nation in the world, probably in history. But we have kicked God out of our society and God will protect his remnant, but uh, he is not going to continue to bless America if America continues in this rebellious fashion. I, and I'm saying that just as a guy who reads the Old Testament and saw the judgment of God on nation after nation because they turned their back on him. And no that's my fear it. for America. We've become arrogant. We've gone from in 2007, you no, know, we were $5 trillion in debt as a nation. Now we're going to be $30 trillion in debt pretty soon. That is unsustainable. Yeah, I don't care who you are. Yeah, and we've never been that bad except in times of war, and we quickly paid it off after. We have no plan to do that right now. We have no nobody's even talking about it. No, nope. no. Nope. All we're no. talking about, Jim, is what can the government do to keep giving people more money? Yeah. You know, uh, people are running out of money. We need another stimulus. We need another st stimulus, and we want a trillion more than the Republicans want. Uh, this, this is just insane when I hear it. I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. Yeah. So it, it, it's concerning because I have eight grandchildren, and, I, and I'm concerned about what, I'm, what we're leaving behind. Uh, absolutely. They, they've got a challenge that's beyond anything you know. And when you saw my former boss, Thomas Massey, getting pounded on by Republicans and Democrats and the media and everybody just for saying, hey, let's like follow this Constitution thing and at least have a vote on this $2.3 trillion <laughs> yeah. you're going to send. You know, exactly. you get that kind of pushback that tells you how far away we are from real right. answers. And uh, you've, right. you've been... Right for decades now right on the front edge of trying to communicate these truths and and do it in a way that it, everyone can receive and as you say definitely injecting eternal truth into this and i and i think that it's been extremely valuable uh for our public discussion and i i hope you have many more years of being able to do that um so if for me well, it's an honor John, I, I 
Well, I, I praise the Lord for that. Anything that any impact that I've been able to have is, is solely because of what the Lord's done for me. Yeah, absolutely. Tell people, um, I know your time is valuable and, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to pick up with you by the way, just right after this, after we stop here, but okay. tell, tell me, um, tell people how they can get, uh, connected with you, uh, what they need to know. And, uh, you did a little bit of okay. that earlier, but maybe recap it here. Yeah, so my website is GaryVarvel.com. It's like Varvel except with a V, and Gary's with one R. So GaryVarvel.com. You can go find my stuff there. I've got videos, and I have a store page with all my stuff. I've, uh, also, uh, I have another uh, page on my website where I did a children's book, and uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about the film stuff, but uh, oh, yeah. I did a movie. I did movies in uh, 2000, 2009 with my son, Brett, and my youngest son, Drew, and we were, it was really a family thing with our church, but did a movie in 2009 called The Board, B-O-A-R-D, also a movie called The War Within in 2014, and in the movie, The War Within, and these are both Christian films, The War Within, by the way, won seven film festival awards, it, was, uh, it did very well. Um, but I did a, a children's book for the world within called the good shepherd. And you can get that at, uh, the world within movie.com, or you can get it at house of grace films.com, or you can get a, a link to it from my website, Gary Also, you can follow me on uh, Facebook, uh, the Gary Varvel or Twitter is at Varvel. I'm not a big fan of Twitter, but I do it. Uh, yeah. I'm on Parler now. I'm on Parler now at the Gary Varvel and Instagram the Gary Varvel. Well, um, I, and by the way, we'll have all that in the show notes, so folks will right. know. I, the other thing I didn't get to ask you about is your thoughts on Babylon B. But I mean, I think you were. <laughs> yeah. well, I tell you what, Babylon B. I uh, I, I would to know love those guys just a little bit. I'm, I'm beginning to get acquainted with them, and they need to start running my cartoons. I would love to be involved with those guys. They're hilarious. And so many times I see their stuff and I go, ah, oh, that would have been a great editorial cartoon. Man, why didn't I think of that? So, so I'll, connect, I'll connect you with them, by the way. Oh, Let's cool. see, because they, they ought to have you on. But because but, um, you're kind of a precursor of where they've gone. You know, they're, they're, they're more yeah. in the satire and humor than you ever were, although yeah. you would do some of that from time to time. But, but still, you're kind of a yeah. precursor to them. So I, I need to connect you with them. But um, I'm just surprised that you and I hadn't gotten to know one another up till now. <laughs> We've know. been running crossways for so long. We're both friends of Mike Pence. Right, uh, right. Just so many things. So it's kind of funny. But it, that's, I, that's why I wanted to reach out to you and hopefully get you on here. And I think it's a lot of valuable information for folks. Well, I'm I'm honored to be on your show, Jim. I you know you've uh, interviewed some heavy hitters over the years, so I have. Uh, this kind of treat for me. <laughs> well, you you fit in with every one of them, and ah. uh, so I'm I, for me, I'm just really grateful for you to come on. Thanks for being on the Against Nice Thanks, podcast, Jim. and I'll talk to you right after. Thank you for joining us today on the Against Nice podcast. Please be sure to go to our website, www.politicsisntnice.com. You can sign up for our email list there just at the top right of the web page. And make sure to follow us on iTunes or Spotify or Stitcher or even the iHeartRadio app. And give us a five-star rating and let people know what you think about our podcast. Again, www dot politics isn't nice dot com join our email list at the top right hand of the page there and follow us on itunes spotify stitcher or iHeartRadio. thanks for joining the show today we'll be back soon